thanks very much for being here, folks. This is good. Um, I, this is my old stomping ground. For eight years, I was the lead trombonist in the Army Jazz and Mass Group at the Loyola Fort Meade. And uh, so it's nice to get back and see some familiar faces and have you back, back in town. Um, I don't, I live in Albuquerque, and I'm just saying I, I, I don't miss the snow, and I don't miss the gray days. But it's great being back here. And the traffic. I definitely don't miss the traffic. <laughs> but everything else is cool. So let me, let me give you a little, um, a little bit of my background, because probably a lot of you guys are saying, well, who is this guy? What the heck is this, is this about? Um, as I told you, I was in the Jazz Ambassador from 1997 to 2005. After that, I went to become professor of trombone at the University of Northern Iowa, and I was there for seven years, and I took second here at New Mexico this year. Um, before that, I was uh, working on my doctorate at the University of Michigan with Dennis Smith. And before that, I was uh, working on my master's degree, got my master's degree at Yale with John Swallow. And before that, I let's see, I got my undergrad degree at Wake Forest, but I spent two years at North Texas. So I've been to a lot of different schools, and all my degrees were in classical performance, even though I got this job with the Jazz Ambassador. Um, so uh, if you've got the handout, you know what we're talking about today, and it's what I call switch hitting which is my description of um, trying to play classical and jazz styles at a high level together in one person. Um, <laughs> and, and this is not something that is uh, typically attempted, but just about everybody in this room, I would imagine, if you're playing trombone, has some experience in both idioms. Either you were a jazz studies major at a university and you played a classical degree every semester, which is the norm in most music schools, or uh, you're a classical player who maybe played in a big band in college or something like that, or is doing that now, or had some jazz experience in high school. So um, this is not an uncommon thing, but it is the standard wisdom that you shouldn't try to do both at the same time. Um, and uh, there are a number of people who kind of violate this law. Um, uh, I'm certainly not the only one. Buddy Baker, who founded you know, the International Trombone Association with others and taught at the University of Northern Colorado for many years, is a great example of a switch hitter. Um, Jeremy Wilson, who's going to be playing tomorrow night. He's with Vanderbilt, playing with Gianna Philharmonic. I understand he's a great jazz player. Um, Harry Waters is a great classical and jazz player. Uh, Alex Isles out in Los Angeles does both very well, plays valves very well, he does everything great. Um, so it's not that this is absolutely unheard of, it's just probably not the norm. And uh, there's obviously many reasons for this. One reason is, of course, it takes a lot of work to get to a high level in any one idiom. If you try to do both at the same time, it's going to take at least twice as much work. Um, I don't know that's necessarily the case because a lot of the technical stuff that you work on in jazz carry, can carry over to classical music. A lot of the uh, technical things that you work on in classical music will carry over to jazz. So it's not like you know, you're know you looking at practicing six hours a day, but you're going to have to practice more than just doing one of these idioms well. So that's a deterrent. And uh, the other thing is that you know I, I often think if I had put as much time into one of these idioms, uh, you know, uh, as I put into both of them. So if I practice four hours a day, just orchestral expert, then maybe that's what I would be doing. But I like playing both. So, you know, I've kind of, I've kind of chosen my path here. So let's get to the slides here. Uh, okay. So why would you want to work on this? Why would you want to work on both? I mean, everybody in this room, if you're a student, you're going to go out and you're going to play principal trombone in the Philadelphia Orchestra. When are you ever going to play jazz? Right? Fair question. Okay. Well, the first answer for why you would want to work on this is what I just stated. Do you enjoy playing both styles of music? That was my case. I think that's the case of most musicians who do this. They like playing both. It enables you to take both classical and jazz slash commercial gigs. So let me give you a statistic, statistic from my own life. Over the course of my collegiate and graduate education, 
I went to school with a little over 100 different trombone majors. Now, a lot of that is because I spent two years at the University of North Texas, and we had anywhere between eight, 75 to 85 trombonists at any one time. So a lot of that is skewed because of North Texas. And, uh, you know, then the other schools I went to, I think we had between 15 and 18 in Michigan. We had six at Yale. We had, I had six from Western at the North Carolina School of the Arts. So you were trying to get ready for grad school because I was just principally a, a jazz player at that point. There were four or five of us there. So it's a little over 100. And out of that 100 folks who were studying trombone as a major in college or grad school, how many do you think made it to be a full-time orchestral performer who has one job that will pay enough to buy a house and a car and raise a family? How many do you think? 25? Two? 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 One. Who said one? <laughs> Very good, sir. You win the prize. One. One of us made it. Now, it's not really fair. This, this, this statistic is not totally fair because not everybody who went to North Texas auditioned for an orchestra. Not everybody was even interested in playing an orchestra. So it's not like... Uh, you know, there were 100 people that went out and we all auditioned for a symphony and, you know, one of us got it. That's, that's really not how it works, of course. I'd say probably maybe 20 of us took some form of professional orchestral audition at some point in our career. Okay, so that's one. Then we had five of us, myself included in this number, who made it into an elite military service band here in Washington, D.C. Let's see, there was Joe Jackson, who was in the Airmen and Oats, Harry Waters. Mike Buckley in the field band. Um, who's the fourth one? Me, that's four. Um, there's one more I'm forgetting. Well, whatever. There were I've, I've counted out. There were five of us. So now we're up to six of us that had full-time playing gigs out of 100. Okay? So what happened to everybody else? Well, some of them just don't have anything to do with music anymore. They either washed out in their freshman or sophomore year, decided it wasn't what they were going to do. They changed their majors. Um, so that's some. Some of them were just straight ahead music educators, and they're out there teaching now. I've got uh, a friend, Scott Cranston, who I went to school with at Yale. He teaches high school in New Caney, Connecticut, and he is a monster trombonist. He plays the New, New Haven Symphony. Um, he played a master's recital that's as good as or better than any professional recital I've ever heard, but he teaches high school. So there's an example of, of somebody that's still in the music profession but's not necessarily performing full-time, and then there are a whole bunch of freelancers. There's a whole bunch of folks that put together either freelance performing careers that are in New York, you know, guys that play on Broadway. There are folks that uh, play in smaller markets that play and teach. Um, they're, they're cobbling together middle class lives that, and they're not necessarily people that you're seeing uh, as big names because they are putting together freelance careers. But the fact of the matter is they're making it. They're doing it. They're out there making a living in music. And so that's the vast majority. Unfortunately, you know, what we teach in academia is well, you're going to do one or the other. You know, you're going to be an orchestral performer or maybe you'll be a jazz performer. But we're not really thinking, okay, well, what if, what if the reality is that most of our students are going to go out there and freelance? How are we going to put together some kind of degree pro pro uh, program like that? Uh, fortunately, the University of New Mexico, we're kind of thinking along those lines now. But, uh, you know, this is after reality after reality of symphonies folding. The New, Me New Mexico Symphony Orchestra folded years ago. It's now the New Mexico Philharmonic and a part-time group. It was a full-time group. I mean, you can just rattle off San Diego, uh, San Antonio. Minnesota just got back from being on a long strike. Um, even if you make it into the orchestral world, um, you're not necessarily guaranteed a job forever in this, in this climate, in this economy. So having some extra skills is, is helpful. The other thing is commercial playing is a part of almost all orchestral gigs. So when I was with the Jazz Ambassadors, we played with Pittsburgh Symphony. We played with Boston Pops. We played with Cincinnati Pops. We played with the National Symphony, Baltimore Symphony. Uh, I'm probably leaving somebody out. We played with a lot of symphony orchestras. We worked with Marvin Hamlisch, who would put us in 
in, in, the, in the middle of the orchestra, and we would play with the orchestra, and we would basically kind of drive the show. It was like big band with orchestral accompaniment in a way. But we were doing that because pop gigs are such a big part of what they do financially, and pop music is really what makes the money for orchestras. It's not really playing Mahler 7. I wish it was playing Mahler 7 in Iron Tree, but that's not it. It's really this kind of uh, quasi-film music, pop music, uh, swing music, uh, with strings. And it's extremely helpful for teaching. So if you're in a market like Dallas and you've got kids who want to study jazz and um, uh, work on their all-state jazz audition material and all you know is classical music, well, you can, you can kind of listen to them. I, I'm not saying you can't work with them, but it'd be a heck of a lot better if you could show them some swing styles or show them you know, uh, how to get a good jazz sound. So this is a, uh, very helpful from a teaching perspective as well. And then uh, to be a better rounded musician able to play anything. The fact of the matter is that there's a lot of new music being written that is basically in a jazz style. I just played a piece by Dana Wilson's Paradox in February. Great piece of music, but it's really kind of jazz written out. Um, Concerto Sub-Zero for bass trombone is essentially a jazz piece that's been written out. Uh, there is a, there's basically like a, 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 a salsa opera that won the Pulitzer Prize a few years ago that's basically salsa music being played by an orchestra. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's, there's a lot of examples of this. And so to me, it's like, okay, well, there's kind of a trend where it might be helpful for us to know something about jazz style, even if all we're interested is, is quote, playing classical music. And then the other thing is, even if you're a jazz musician, there are pieces that are being written in a classical style. And the prime example of this is Neely Snyder. Neely Snyder's music is very heavily influenced by classical style and uh, the way that you would uh, articulate, cut notes off, all that kind of stuff is, is kind of coming out of a classical tradition and not necessarily out of a straight ahead uh, swing jazz tradition. So the thing that makes this hard, <laughs> not to pile, pile on the hard stuff, Virtually everything about classical and jazz styles is different, including all these things. The sound is different, your rhythm is different, the way you interpret rhythm is different, articulation is different, note length, note ending, vibrato, intonation, phrase, and band. All this stuff is different. And I'm gonna go through and catalog these things and talk about them and try to give us some strategies, as you can see from the handout, for, for working on these things to try to get that around. So, typical problems going from classical music to jazz. Sound has too much resonance. So if I'm thinking about a classical sound and one word to describe that classical sound on the trombone, to me, it's resonance. Now, I spent a lot of time studying with Arnold Jacobs, and that was his word. And uh, by resonance, I mean a ringing sound that has basically all the overtones that we have the potential to get in our sound as we're playing. So most of you probably know the, the physics, the acoustics behind what we play. When you play a B flat, you're not just getting a low B flat, you're getting in the sound mostly that low B flat, but you're also getting the B flat an octave above that, and you're getting an F a fourth above that, and you're getting the B flat a fourth above that, and et cetera, just like you have in the overtone theory. So all these pitches are present, and the more of them, oh, sorry, more than we get, the more resonant of a sound we're going to get. And this is created by getting your lip tissue to, to vibrate with maximum uh, efficiency underneath the mouthpiece. And I'm going to talk about how to do that. I mean, that's, that's a whole master class in and of itself. Rhythm is stilted. Time is not exact. So um, it, it might sort of be grooving, but it's not really grooving uh, when, when classical players play all the time. Not sure how to improvise and unwilling to try. Um, this is one of the great frustrations of jazz players is that classical players just don't have any interest in improvising at all. And there's a great tradition, obviously, of improvising in classical music. People like Beethoven and Mozart would make stuff up on the spot. And we've lost that because of really the importance of composers since Beethoven. And uh, you can you can even improvise classical music if you want. Um, I was going to do that. We couldn't get a piano player but I was gonna show you, you know, an improvised Bordoni over a, a Bordoni piano accompaniment. 
So it doesn't have to be in jazz. You can improvise in any way you want. Um, but most classical musicians just want to stay to the page and not really develop this creative side that is uh, potential. Articulations are not hard enough. So, and we'll talk about this, in jazz is generally going to come things harder than in classical music. And generally, uh, classical musicians going to jazz don't do that as much as they need to. Note any tapered and rhythmically inexact. They float. It's great for classical music. It just doesn't line up rhythmically when you're playing jazz. Note length too long. So again, this kind of kind of robs the uh, the rhythmic impact that you get when you're playing jazz or commercial music. But uh, in classical music, it's great because it gives it a very smooth flowing character. Use slide vibrato and snare in and out of notes too often. Uh, I don't know a whole lot of professional players that do this, but I do know students who do this. So, man, I'm talking a lot. So let's see if I can do this. classical playing uh, jazz and this is what I call like pop orchestra style we get this big fat uh, resonant sound we're not really tugging hard rhythm isn't quite totally swinging maybe sort of um, and well slide by bra I'll, I'll give you an example of that that's not a good tune to, to try to demonstrate that on um, but there's there is a trend with classical musicians sometimes to try to smear in and out of things and play with a lot of slide vibrato to make it kind of jazzy. So, what are we going to do? Things to work on. You got to deaden the sound a little bit. We worked so hard to get this doggone resonant sound and now you're telling me we got to deaden it? Well, yeah, because that's a good jazz sound. It's not, you know, it's not this ringing resonant sound. All right, so what do we do? Well, tonguing closer to your upper teeth is going to deaden the sound somewhat. So my teacher, Dennis Smith, man, he tongued as far back as anybody I've ever heard in my life. That's basically it, and the tip of the tongue in, in that instance, my t the tip of my tongue is really on the roof of my mouth, the hard palate where it goes up. Um, and the closer you get to your teeth, the harder the attack becomes and the less resonant your sound becomes. So some of this is just where your tongue is landing in your mouth. Um, you need less space in your mouth than classical playing. Some of this is taken care of by tonguing on your front teeth. So, in that, in that classical sound, my tongue is pretty flat towards the back of my mouth, and just the tip of my tongue is flicking up to articulate. And if I in that instance, because I'm tonguing on my upper teeth, the tongue is kind of flat in my mouth. It's not arched like this. Uh, it's not something that I consciously do, but I am aware of what this stuff is going on from having studied both idioms. So you need less space in your mouth um, because we need less air hitting the embouchure to make it vibrate so that we get this really beautiful vibrant sound. The lower jaw, my lower jaw when I play with a jazz sound is closer than my upper jaw, fractionally, but it's there, I can feel it. Um, what else, tongue is higher in the mouth, we talked about that, that a lot of that is taken care of because of the fact that you're tonguing on your upper teeth. Uh, another thing you can work on, listen to great jazz players, it seems pretty obvious, but um, if you're going to learn a language or an idiom, you're gonna have to listen to it to get better at it. And you know, you, you young folks are ex exceptionally blessed with the riches of the entire history of recorded music available on the internet for free now. It's not good for people like me to make CDs, 
but it's really good if you want to study this stuff. And um, unfortunately, recordings do not do a super duper job of capturing our sound. Um, the really the most amazing brass instrument sound I ever heard in my life was played by Arnold Jacobs. It was at one of his summer sessions at Northwestern University. It was one of the last ones he did. He had a student who had a Hertzbrunner tuba that he uh, helped design by sending his York tuba over to Switzerland and then they copied it. And so he wanted to see how the horn came out. He was not playing actively. Uh, he was had terrible arthritis, diabetes, glaucoma. Um, he had the, the the, the rumor that goes around, the urban legend, is that he only had one lung. No, he always had two lungs. He had part of a lung removed because he had lung cancer. His, his wife was a smoker, and so from secondhand smoke, he got lung cancer. So that was taken out. He had emphysema from the secondhand smoke. So his respiratory system was not f fully functioning, and he was not actively playing. He buzzed a few notes on his embouchure visualizer that he always carried around with him, he could barely hold the tuba. I was surprised he could even manage that. And bam, this gorgeous sound comes out that I've never heard. You know, I mean, all the overtones were present in his sound. And um, so, uh, you know, the recordings will help you with sound somewhat, but not totally. Because when you listen to recordings of Gibbs, you really don't get that entire spectrum of sound that he is capable of producing. So uh, I say this. Uh, with a, a grain of, of caution that it's really almost better to work with a teacher who can play with this kind of sound or um, to listen to folks live. All right. Rhythm. So sound is really important to making the switch between classical and jazz, and rhythm is extraordinarily important as well. Swing feel needs to be worked on. How do you do that? Okay, here's a really simple way. Play single note lines of swing eighth notes. That's all you got to do. Put, on, put a metronome on two and four. You can put it on one, two, three, four. It doesn't matter. And now, let me make a caveat here. Do not exaggerate the shortness of the upbeat and the accent. So a typical flaw of uh, most of the students I work with is they, they exaggerate both on the upbeat. You know, that, that's really not a good swing style. It's really pretty quirky. Um, so it's much more subtle than that. It's still there. It's just not as pronounced as really accenting that upbeat and making it incredibly short. So just be careful of that. Record yourself, obviously. Uh, you know, recording yourself is good for fixing just about any problem that you have. You have to have that objective feedback by listening to yourself. If you're studying with somebody, they're not going to be in a practice with you, room with you every time. So guess what? You gotta you gotta kind of be your own teacher and get this objective feedback. And then work on various tempos. I think we all understand that. You know, if you're playing swing. <laughs> You know, and, and playing it, you know, like half note equals 150. It's basically totally flattened out at that point. So you got to work on the, the different tempos to figure that out. Play swing eighth notes along with recordings. Get yourself a Count Basie tune. I can't say an album anymore. I got to say a download or something. Uh, <laughs> but get yourself some, some Count Basie recordings and play along with them. Figure out what the tonic of the key is. And just play your string of eighth note lines along with that recording. Try to lock into a groove with it. This is not something we typically do in classical music. There certainly are tunes that groove. Uh, Rite of Spring definitely has a groove to it, but it's not common in late romantic music. And so this is something that we have to work on. And of course, listen to players with a great swing feel. So we've, I've talked about listen to players for sound. Now I'm saying listen to them for rhythm and all these guys that I've named has a different swing feel, slightly different. Uh, Frank Rosalino's really emphasizes the shortness of the upbeat. And J.J. Uh, Johnson has a more kind of straight up and down. It's a more even kind of swing. Um, they're all different. And just getting an idea of how these guys deal with swing eighth notes 
is really helpful, and this will eventually become a part of your style if you're an improviser. It's a part of what, what makes us us. Uh, so everybody's a little bit different with that. Okay, articulation. So some of this stuff you guys are already, already going to know, but every time I clinic a jazz band, I have to go over this stuff. You've got a tongue a lot harder than you used to uh, from classical music. Classical music, I hardly use any tongue at all. Now I'm barely tonguing that, and most of that is air producing the separation between those notes. Uh, in jazz, basically you're not all going to have the page reflect what you're going to do. And most of you are aware that jazz performance practice will be have isolated quarter notes, eighth notes, sixteenth notes. In other words, they have a rest before them and a rest after them. You're going to play those short, even if it's not marked short, unless it's marked length. Strings of eighth notes are quasi legato. It could be a, a duplet of eighth notes. It could be just two eighth notes. First one's going to be long. Second one's going to be short. It could be eight eighth notes. First through seven is going to be long. Last eighth note is going to be short. Phrase endings are always short. If you get to a, a phrase ending, the, the, the very last note of that phrase is going to be short, generally 100% of the time. So I wrote this out. You got it in your handout. And... I'll play, uh, I'll play the top line. This is what you might see in a jazz chart. Hopefully they'll give you some articulation, but they might not. So if a classical player was looking at this, well, we would play it. If you're playing jazz, so hopefully you can hear the difference in the sound and the, the, the hardness of the attack that I'm using. Um, I'm also um, playing pretty short on these notes. They're definitely not on the long side, as, as I demonstrated in the classical way of doing this. And then, of course, you're going to tongue both the front and the end of the note. It's a syllable like gut or cut. It's not just B or B, uh, where you have uh, the ending uh, is just basically a vowel, and it just kind of floats out there. We want a consonant at the end of these notes, even if they're short. Same thing with long notes. Um, so... So that's a pretty hard tongue cut off. That's a pretty gentle tongue cut off, but there's still a tongue cut off there. And why is that? And as I said, I don't. It doesn't always have to be a hard tongue cut off. Uh, you don't taper note endings, um, and long notes typically crescendo a little bit. Um, they can taper. Maria Schneider's Music Boy tapers all over the place. So. That's uh, pretty much holding full, full uh, dynamic level. That's giving a little bit of crescendo on the tongue cut off. These are all things that uh, you will have to do if you're playing uh, in, in jazz and particularly in a big band. Um, the reason why we do that is because it gives us a much cleaner rhythmic re release. Uh, if everybody's kind of releasing in different spots, then it, it doesn't quite have the same cleanness, A, and it doesn't have the same kind of rhythmic impact. And then smearing in and out of notes a lot does not make you jazzier. You know, I mean, I hear students do this, and I don't know where they're getting it from, but I think that they, they think that this is going to make them sound jazzy, you know? It's not that I'm not using falls and smearing in the notes. I'm just not emphasizing it as much. The rhythm is a little bit better, and the sound is not so resonant. All right, more things to work on. Oh, my God. Vibrato. Depends on the style of jazz. Again, this is one of these things that becomes part of your personal style of playing. And um, there's you know, so many different approaches. I mean... Jay Johnson will use a really kind of a, a fast, narrow, almost classically oriented jaw vibrato. Um, somebody like Carl Fontana. I mean, it's very wide, very wide. 
typically starts at the beginning of the note. Uh, Frank Rosalino will use uh, like a slide vibrato at the end, the very end of the note. Um, Irby Green has got this combination jaw and slide vibrato going on, which is a really distinctive sound for him. So we've got all these different types of vibrato. Basically, in bebop through modern jazz, you're going to use less vibrato than in early jazz through modern jazz. So somebody like Conrad Hurwitz uses zero vibrato. I mean, I've, I only have heard very few recordings where he's using any vibrato at all. Um, there, one of my favorite jazz players of all time is a guy in Europe named Adrian Mears. He runs the Vienna Art Orchestra now, and he's a phenomenal player and writer. And he uses quite a quite wide vibrato all the time. <coughs> so there's a lot of range there. I'm not saying that uh, you can't use vibrato in modern jazz. It's just the tendency is for folks to use less. And then in early jazz swing, Basie and Ellington charts, oh yeah, it's all over the place. Um, <laughs> Basie chart, I'll use <laughs> that wide of a vibrato and that fast because that matches what the lead alto player, Marshall Royal, was doing. So when I was in the Jazz Ambassadors, I mean, I, I would sit down and listen to reams of recordings and try to figure out, okay, what's this guy doing? What's this guy doing? What's he doing on this chart? How are they approaching it? How are they approaching the pass? How are they approaching the vibrato? What's the intonation like? What's this guy sound like? Um, <coughs> all this stuff goes into creating an authentic performance of this music. Improvising. Don't be afraid to improvise, guys. It's easy. Stick to a limited set of notes <coughs> and concentrate on the rhythmic feel. This is stuff that I work on with high school students and college students all the time. Um, you don't need to play every note in whatever scale is available in a chord for it to work. I mean, there, there's some notes that are more equal than others. <coughs> if you're playing a blues with B-flat, you know, you can play, you can just play a solo out of the, uh, the scale degrees. So we, in the first example, we have B-flat, C, D-flat, F, G, and B-flat. And that'll put together a pretty darn good solo. You're not going to make the changes totally, okay, but those notes will work. Same thing with the minor pentatonic scale over there on the right. Um, don't make it complicated for yourself. And I think a lot of students focus on, well, what note can I play that's really hip? You don't need a hip note. Play a hip rhythm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one of the things I'll do in a clinic is I'll, um, I'll play uh, a B-flat blues, have the rhythm section play a B-flat blues. And I'll play a blues using all the right notes, but terrible rhythm. And then I'll do the exact same thing, and I'll have the rhythm section play in B flat, and I'll play an E or B natural on top of it. No right notes at all, zero. But really great time. And everybody says, oh, yeah, that's the solo, man. That's cool. <laughs> because the time is good. So uh, really, I'm not saying play all wrong notes all the time when you're a jazz improviser, but in the hierarchy of things, really rhythm is more important to constructing a good solo in a lot of ways than your note choices are. Obviously, if you're going to keep going with this, boy, there's all kinds of things you can do with note choices, but the time has to be there. If the time goes out the window and you're trying to play something hip, it doesn't sound good. Short phrase endings and short phrase length. So a lot of students, um, they'll, they'll try to play a long end to whatever their phrase is. <laughs> Instead of just let, just let there be space, you know? Space is good. Leave space. There we go. Uh, and then obviously work on it a little bit every day. Look, if you just took, if you're a classical player and you said, okay, I want to learn this, if you would set aside 10 or 15 minutes a day to work on a couple different keys of blues and, and do it this way and, and stay to a confined set of notes and work on your rhythm, you're going to be okay. You're going to, you, you know, you've got enough chops to be able to do it. So it's, it's really about just getting used to it. And if you do it for even 10, 15 minutes a day, it's going to make a big difference in what you're able to do. Okay, let's talk about the jazz guys going to classical. <coughs> As I said at the beginning of this, jazz guys actually, the, the switch hitting element is already kind of built in to our collegiate education system because they got to play classical juries every semester at most schools. 
So they're already learning about classical music. Um, but having said that, boy, I sure have had to work on uh, these problems with lots of students. So here we go. Sound lacks resonance and can be hard. Uh, notes are too short. Again, this is just a catalog of stuff, and, and we tend to do it to one degree or another on these various aspects. Articulations are too hard. Vibrato is not appropriate. Um, they, they try to use a jazz vibrato on classical music. It's just not going to work. Notes cut off abruptly. Intonation is not exact enough. It's a pretty big deal in classical music. It's not as big of a deal in, in jazz. And then dynamics are not always supportive of phrases. So let me see if I can demonstrate this. You know, now, it, you may not hear anything quite that nasty, but you might hear, you know, you can hear the difference. So what do we need to work on going from jazz to classical, getting resonance in the sound? Again, this is a whole like master class unto itself. It took me a while studying with Jake to really be able to get a resonant sound, uh, although I was able to do it almost instantaneously in the lessons. It took a while to assimilate that and make that my sound. So what do we do? It, it really, resonance is about getting chops to buzz across their entire length underneath the mouthpiece point. That's what creates that sound. Um, because in jazz playing, it's, it's steady. So I know that there's something involved with this. Now, um, we do this by getting air up to the embouchure and making it buzz. Um, air is the motor force that makes this thing go. The better you get the motor force up to the lip, the better it's going to buzz. The instrument just amplifies it. I mean, if, if we've got a great PA system here and I'm a crummy singer, I'm going to still sound like a crummy singer on this beautiful PA system. And uh, if I am a great singer and I have no PA system or even a bad PA system, I'm still going to be a great singer. So you have to be a great singer with your lips. And the way to do that is to get air up to your chops and allow them to buzz. So how do we do that? Buzz on an embouchure visualizer. All right, so this is the ring that, you know, it's a mouthpiece rim on a stick. Many of you may have these uh, that Jake would use routinely to get his chops to buzz and immediately go to the instrument. So you just need a buzz. Just buzz away at them and immediately go to the buzz. And most of these students are going to play for a little bit, and then they're going to go back to their kind of non-resonant sound. For most students, I'd say 90% 90 per, 90 of the students I work with with this, if I can just get them to produce a good note on this, they will get a resonant sound on the trombone immediately. And then it's just a question of getting that to be the norm, their habit of how they sound on the instrument. All right, so that's one way. And, and, and you know, a lot of students, you, you look at them and they'll sound get a bad sound on this, you're going to get a bad sound on the instrument. Um, so they've got to get a good, strong, vibrant buzz sound. Okay. Open up the lower jaw, keep the tongue low in the mouth. So the difference for me is when I play with a resonant sound, my jaw drops a little bit and goes forward. I'm not saying that that's going to be the case for you because everybody's jaw structure, tooth structure, et cetera, mouth structure is different. But um, chances are you're going to have to open things up. So to me, I think of it like basically we have, you would think it's a double reed instrument because we have two lips, right? But it's really a single reed instrument. Hopefully most of you are aware of this. If I play... <laughs> my tongue on my lower lip, it doesn't sound great, but I can still get a sound out of this thing. But if I put my tongue on my upper lip, there's nothing that's going to come out. No vibration at all. So that tells me that 
doing, the bulk of the vibration in the embouchure is coming off the top lip. And it's just like a clarinet mouthpiece where you've got like a reed that's straight, hopefully, and you have rails. You have the, a curve to the, the mouthpiece facing <coughs> and a tip opening. Um, if that tip is too close to the reed, there's really no room for that reed to vibrate. So you're not going to really be able to play with any kind of resonance or volume. If it gets too far away, obviously it's got nothing to vibrate against and it's going to be very difficult to control. So. You reach a point, starting off from my teeth being totally together, to opening up my lower jaw, where you get a sweet spot of, of a great sound, and then you know, obviously the pitch drops off, it goes very flat, and complete, you completely lose it. But most students, uh, if they're not getting a resonant sound, they've got something going on where um, their jaw is, the lower jaw is too close to their upper jaw, and a lot of that develops around having a very weak air supply um, to their embouchure because having a, a closed off embouchure works really well with very little air. But as soon as you start feeding that embouchure air, it can function very well with uh, it being more open. Keep the airways open by keeping your lungs full of air. Again, this is like a whole, a whole other master class, so I'm just briefly touching on this here. Arnold Jacobs studied medicine at the University of Chicago uh, Medical School. He studied with doctors in the area. He looked at cadavers. Uh, he did all kinds of things to study respiratory structure and function. And what he discovered was that the less air there is in the lungs, the less efficient we are with giving it out. And the body will actually unconsciously start to ration it. So your bronchial tubes in your lungs will start to close down a little bit. Your throat will close. I mean, there's all kinds of things that go on that you're not even aware of because we're not wired to feel that. Oops, sorry. <laughs> we're not wired to feel that so well. Uh, so uh, the bottom line is, this is a very complicated way of saying keep your doggone lungs full of air. Take in a lot of air, and you'll be able to produce this resonant sound much easier. Listen to great classical players. Again, live is preferable to recordings just because you, you, the resonance in your sound is not going to be as apparent through the technique of recording as it will be if you're listening to great ones. Articulation, back off on the amount of tongue force. So um, for Dennis Smith, when I was studying with him, that's a good one. So basically the air, that's all no tongue. Uh, the air, letting it out and burst like that is really what's creating the separation, not the tongue. So there I'm using the tongue as a valve to really cut the notes off. In classical music, we're just using a bare minimum of tongue to give a front to the note, and the air is doing the work of creating the separation between the notes. Um, I, I hesitated to, to, to bring this up to students. But then I heard uh, David Thompson, this very, very fine horn soloist who works in Spain now, and uh, he said the exact same thing. So I was like, okay, well, yeah, that's probably the way I need to teach it and think about it. Um, again, this is all just reiterating what I just said. Tongue well behind the upper teeth on the hard palate. Um, you know, the, the farther back I tongue, the less prominent the articulation is. Woo, we got a lot of stuff. Notes need to be long with well-tapered endings, okay? So a tendency in jazz is to look at a quarter note that ends a phrase as a quarter note. And you cut it right off on beat two. But I listen to many, many fine classical players on all instruments and vocalists. And, you know, they might have a quarter note ending in the phrase, and they're playing it like it's a dotted half note or a whole note even. Um, there's a lot of stretching of time, particularly on phrase endings. Uh, in classical music, and so the note value is not completely 100% the gospel. Now, if you're doing ensemble playing, well, even with orchestras, I hear orchestras bleeding over and, and playing notes long. Um, it's, you can get away with more of this in solo playing, obviously, than, than in ensemble playing. Um, so we talked about that. The notes should taper. So... <coughs> Okay, 
break the trend there, hopefully down to just about nothing at the end of that note. I'm not cutting it off. The volume is not the same through that note. Back off on vibrato towards the end of the note. Bill Lefty is an absolute master of this. So. So he uses more vibrato at the beginning of the note when um, the, jaw, the volume of that note, the decibel level, can handle that amount of jaw movement. And as the note progresses, it gets less and less to the point where he's not using any vibrato at all. So that's, it's not him saying that it's the end of the note. The Glenn Dawson, well, he taught just about everybody who taught a lesson. He would say uh, that the beginning of the note is very important, but the end of the note is probably more important than the beginning. So he really paid attention to ends of notes, and you can totally hear that in Joe Alessi's playing. Uh, staccato, you know, just barely separated from the next note. It's, it's not, it's, it's jazz staccato is and classical is I mean it's it, it, the note the ring of the note is, is really kind of like almost touching the beginning of the next note but that's how we do it so vibrato okay vibrato in classical music is more standardized than the vibrato in jazz you can hear all kinds of things in jazz playing in classical music it's really much more standardized so we have typically a, a triplet or sixteenth note rhythm to it, the speed that it's, it's, these waves are being created, and what I call a sine curve. So in other words, the vibrato goes up and it goes down in about the same way. All right? It doesn't go straight up and straight down. This is more common in faster vibratos, European vibratos. So... <laughs> Um, let's see, Jacques Marger is a good example of this. A lot of the French guys have very nice sine curve vibrato. Uh, Jay Friedman has a little bit slower and wider vibrato. So it's more like da 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 da. So that's like a triplet, and it can be very wide. Um, most classical guys, it's around triplet to, to 16th note speed, depending on the tempo. If it's a slower tempo, you can get away with 16th note vibrato. The faster tempo is going to be more like triplets, and it may even be eighth notes if it's fast enough. And can be wider or narrower, depending on the taste of the performer. Yeah, so um, we have guys that have vibrato that's kind of barely there, and, you know, Jay, Jay Friedman has a pretty wide vibrato. Some classical trombones use a lot, some almost none. Michel Bouquet began his career, a uh, very fine French trombonist, and he used vibrato constantly on just about everything. And by the time you get to his career now, he uses barely any. Uh, Ian Bousfield is another example of a very fine player who uses very minimal vibrato. Uh, intonation, okay, so <coughs> intonation in jazz for whatever reason, is I hear a lot more out of tune playing in jazz. It may it's not horrendously, but it's definitely not quite as exact as classical playing. You really have to be on the money to get intonation in classical playing. So most jazz players that are going to classical music, you've got to work on that. Tuning drones. We are so lucky to have these drones of uh, intervals in Pythagorean tuning available for purchase. And uh, what I do is. I play just slow scales. I might play minor going up, major going down. I work on these intervals, and you know, once the interval gets locked in, I feel good about it. I'll move to the next note, but I won't move until I get that note locked in. Practice with piano tracks. Um, there are all kinds of tracks, either uh, electronically generated or live. Uh, there's a Bodoni series by this guy David Schwartz that I love to use the CDs with because it really helps the tuning and really makes a lot of musical sense. You can finally hear what these harmonies are and the accompaniment part and how the, the Bordoni vocalese will fit into that. Uh, they're wonderful to work with. And uh, we have smart music now that's available for all kinds of classical solo pieces. There's all kinds of ways you can do this. Pianos don't move, right? So you've got, you've got to figure out how to play in tune with the piano. And you can't have a pianist there all the time unless you're married to one, I guess. So you've got to you got to use tracks. Know your intonation tendencies. Are you sharp or flat? I tend to play sharp. That's just that's the way it is, man. 
if I'm off, I'm probably a little bit sharp. So I immediately think about moving down a little bit. I might be wrong, and then I can immediately bring it back up and correct it. But generally, that's my tendency. That's kind of how I hear. Um, some people play flat. It's much easier for the audience to hear if something is flat than if something is sharp. Um, but if you know what your tendency is, then you can actually do something about it when you hear that you're out of tune. So it's not a bad thing to be aware of. Make pitch corrections with the slide for out of tune par for three. I don't know how many students I see who play F and regular uh, F above the staff in regular fifth position, or E, a half step down for it in regular seventh position. That is not where those notes are if you're going to play them in tune. And if you are going to play them in tune in those positions, then you're going to have to need to lift those notes down to the embouchure which means more work for the embouchure, and it also means that you're not really getting the best resonance out of that note because your lips are buzzing uh, a, a pitch that is slightly below where the slide is set to resonate. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of good reasons why you need to work on these. When I went to Yale, I really wasn't aware of this stuff, and Don Swallow was a great drill sergeant and you know, would harass me like, what, you don't really care whether you play out of tune or not? Like, what the hell's the matter with you? So, <laughs> anybody here sw study with Swallow? Yeah, okay, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, uh, so I just started writing them in. Everything I got, man, I just wrote them in, and then it became automatic. Uh, intonation has a significant effect on how we perceive sound quality. So even if you play with a really great resonant sound, if you're playing flat, it's not going to sound so good. So it's really crucial that we work on that. Phrasing and dynamics. Um, when I started studying classical music, I really didn't understand this, quote, this quote, musicality thing. And so I've kind of made it my mission over the years to try to figure out what do people mean when they talk about musicality. Um, if, if you're just playing a line in jazz, uh, it should be shaped, but not always do we do that. In classical music, if you're playing a Bordoni, man, you know, you may have a dynamic, but I think of it as an average dynamic, and we may be going below or above that dynamic as we go along. And so um, you, have to, you have to do this in order to play classical music right. Otherwise, it just sounds like complete nonsense. Uh, dynamic ra range in phrases is generally wider in classical music. Yeah, I do believe that than, than playing in a big band of jazz. Even if you might have a big crescendo, the way you're getting there is probably not through a long phrase. So, got just about maybe seven minutes left. Let me sum it up. Um, the two big points today, look, if you, if you, no matter what you want to do with your career, if you can play an additional style to what you really like and focus on, it's going to help you make a living. I have seen this happen over and over and over again. Do not assume that if you practice orchestral excerpts for four years of undergrad and two years of grad school that you're going to make an orchestral gig that pays you a living. There's plenty of orchestral gigs out there, but they might pay you $12,000 a year. So you're going to have to do something else to make it. And these, these styles are, are really different. I mean, hopefully you've seen that today with this catalog of stuff. There's all kinds of things that are different between the two styles that we have to work on. And if you know that, you can kind of say, okay, well, my sound is pretty good, but maybe my rhythm needs to be straightened out. My intonation is great, but uh, I'm, I'm not good with phrasing. So hopefully that will take care of that. Any questions anybody has? Everybody's got it all figured out, huh? No questions? Nobody has one question. Yes, sir. Huh? This is actually a Courtois with a Sterling Dub. Right, right. So obviously everything that I've demonstrated to you today has been on this large floor, you know, plastic, classical 547, eight and a half inch bell instrument. Uh, if I'm playing a jazz gig, I'm not going to play this instrument. But uh, first of all, I couldn't bring both horns on a plane without risking damage one of them. Second of all, I wanted you to hear the difference between these two styles on the same piece of equipment, same horn, same mouthpiece. Now, I, I will definitely play a smaller instrument when I'm playing jazz, and I'll play a smaller mouthpiece. So I'm not good with switching around mouthpieces. It really screws up my chops. So I have whole sets of um, screw rim mouthpieces with different cups. 
So this happens to be um, on Sinkowitz Concert Hall 5G today. Uh, I've got deeper ones. I've got, uh, I don't have anything in this little large board that's really a lot shallower than this. And then I have jazz mouthpieces. I have an alto mouthpiece, and they all use the same one. So I can't play on a really huge uh, mouthpiece for them. I'm playing on like a 5G mouthpiece, which is really like a Remington one that's got an LA that's made for me. And that allows me to, to be able to do both classical and jazz and get an appropriate sound for each. If it gets too much on the big end, it doesn't sound good for jazz. If it gets too much on the small end, it doesn't sound good for classical music. So, what else? Yes, sir. Yep. Well, um, what what Jake taught me is think of like ho, 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 ho. If you can say ho, ho, um, that will keep the, the back of the tongue down and you're just kind of flicking the tip of the tongue up, tongue up to create the consonant P. Um, so that was probably the best. Like flip the head and then flip the yep. Yeah, it's more shaped like that. So it's, it's like down flat and then you're, the tip of the tongue is just flicking up. Now, the farther back from tongue, the easier it is to, to do this. You know, the, the farther the tongue gets towards your teeth, the more kind of flattened out the tongue is, the more space it's taking up in your mouth. So simply by tonguing farther back, not only does it make the consonant less, but it also creates more space in your mouth for that air to get up to your embouchure to clear the resonance in your mouth. Yep. What else? Nothing else? Okay, guys. Well, thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank ECW for having me and the University of New Mexico for paying my freight out here. And uh, if you have any questions, you can always email me at, at cbuckholt at unm.edu. I also have a website. It's just my name, chrisbuckholt.com. Pretty easy. And I really appreciate you guys being a great audience and, and showing up today. Thanks a lot.